<clears throat> thank you very much, President Falwell, and thank you all for giving me such a warm welcome to Liberty. I am really honored to be with you. You know, we speak on the floor of the House, and there are millions of people watching us, but I've never spoken to a crowd this large at one time, so it's a little intimidating. It's a special honor, though, to be here with James Langford, someone I admire, but I'm really sorry, in a way, to be on the same stage with James, because he made his living as a youth pastor, and he's such an accomplished speaker. I know he is going to do a great job. I guess you could say we represent a little bit of the diversity of the House of Representatives. I'm also proud to have spoken at the Helm School this morning to a group of students. The, one of the greatest compliments I ever get from people in my district or in North Carolina is that I'm a female Jesse Helms. And uh, there is no greater compliment to get than that, in my opinion. I have ties to Liberty. I've watched Liberty from its founding. And I have a woman in my office who came as an intern. And her first day there, she, um, did something for me. I asked her to get me a quote, and she got it for me right away. And I told my chief of staff, you're going to keep Tabitha here as long as I'm here. She's been with me 12 years, and she runs the office. I've had other interns from Liberty, and they're always outstanding people, and we love having them. Uh, I... <laughs> If you're interested in internships, I hope you'll be in touch with me and other members um, and come to the Hill and learn what it is like to um, see behind the scenes. I consider myself a constitutional conservative. As As I think most of you know, our Constitution is based on biblical principles. I've been asked to talk about what it means to live out faith in policymaking. And I noticed that you all have something called We the Champions. I read the Liberty Journal last night. It was available to me, and I'm so glad I had a chance to do that. And you have we, the champions. And I noticed the we is like the we and we, the people. I carry this pocket constitution with me everywhere I go to remind groups I speak with, and particularly school groups, that this is our Bible in a sense. And I think those three words, we, the people, are the three most important words outside the Bible. Because we are the ones in charge of our government, and we should not forget that. I want to tell you that it's easy to look at what we're doing in Congress in many ways and see the big issues that are related to conservative policies, sanctity of life, sanctity of marriage, the right of the church to exist and influence American life. But then there are issues that don't seem to be so clearly connected to our faith and what it means to view the world the way God does. But we deal with those issues every day in the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. But since this is convocation and not a government class, I'm not going to give you a lesson in government. <laughs> but I am going to do a little bit to try to relate to you 
other issues other than those big ones you hear in the headlines all the time. We work on legislation, for example, to improve the workplace. OSHA is in my committee. So we have a responsibility to make sure that in as much as the federal government should be involved, we want safe workplaces. That obviously is a principle that Christians believe in. And we can rearrange commas, make minor changes to a lot of laws. But what I'm working on right now is a real reform of higher education. And as President Falwell said to you, one of the things that we do is we do oversight for the Department of Education. And so it's our responsibility to say to the secretary and the people that she works with that she must abide by the laws. One of the problems we had in the last administration is that the law didn't seem to mean much to that administration. And it often went off on tangents by itself. And we could call the people in, talk to them, hold a hearing, but we often couldn't make them come back to what the law was. They were writing laws themselves. But we're working on a law you should be really concerned about. It's the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, but we're calling it the PROSPER Act. And PROSPER stands for promoting real opportunity, success, and prosperity through education reform. And it is the first true reform of higher education since 1965. We're dealing with the issues of freedom of speech, freedom to teach the religious beliefs this school espouses, the protections that faith-based groups need today and will certainly need in the future. That's very important in our country because if we cannot adhere to this book here, this constitution, then we are not a great country. And we are the greatest country in the world. And don't you let anybody tell you anything differently. And what we want to do is to protect what liberty is doing here and what you want to do as educated Christians in the world. I'm also interested in helping people who don't want a baccalaureate degree, at least not right now. I want us to honor all kinds of professions, and we haven't done that in our country in the past. I had a brother who was a senior in high school, and he said to me, I said to him, he said, I don't want to go to college, but I don't want you and mom and daddy to be ashamed of me. And that really hit me in my heart. And I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be a carpenter. And so I helped him get into a carpentry apprenticeship program where he could hone his skills and use his God-given talents to build things. Because we certainly need carpenters in this world, don't we? We all know it was a carpenter who changed the world irrevocably. And so my goal is to help people of all occupations be able to get the skills they need and get the certifications that they need. Because we know God wants all kinds of people out there with the skills to serve others. You don't need a baccalaureate degree. Not everybody needs one. Some people do, but not everyone does. And so we're doing that. We're also, again, trying to protect people who want to work, not necessarily with any degrees or any certifications. We want to make the paths as smooth as possible for any of those. And to me, that's clearly a statement of Christian values, honoring all life 
honoring all vocations. So that's what we do in our job in the committee. And I want to tell you, I come from it from, I grew up extraordinarily poor, but I've always felt that education was a path out of prosperity, and I have felt God leading me in everything that I have done. And God knows I need continued encouragement. We have to have encouragement, and you can do that through praying for us, as I know you do, through encouraging us. We have a community of believers in Congress, but we can use encouragement. So I hope you will consider your own calling, whatever that may be, and look to have your voices heard in whatever occupation you're in. I'll tell you, I read two devotionals every morning. One is Jesus Calling. Many of you do that. And my Bible study group reads that. And we believe God shuffles those and gives you exactly the reading you need for the day. I also read Experiencing God Day by Day by the Blackabees. And those are important to me. But what else is important to me is being around my colleagues who encourage me and people at home who tell me when I go home, I'm praying for you or write me letters. I want you to know we're all involved with public policy. And you either can be involved or you can, as they say, you're either at the table making decisions or you may be on the menu. So think about that as students. Get involved now in college, but stay involved. Become educated. Learn about how deep and far and wide public policy goes and find a place where you can influence that public policy. Doesn't have to be in elected office, doesn't have to be working on a campaign. It could be showing up at a school board meeting and making sure your voice is heard there. You've been given a great gift at, to have the opportunity to come to Liberty. Take advantage of this great gift that's been given to you. Thank the good Lord many times a day that you were born in the United States of America and that you have the opportunity to be among the freest, greatest people in the world. God bless you and thank you for letting me be here. Thank you, Representative Fox. I wish we had 434 more like you in Congress. That'd be a much, much better country if we did. But I um, want to introduce our next speaker, Senator James Lankford. He served as Director of Student Ministry at the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma and Director of the Falls Creek Youth Camp. It's one of the largest, it's the largest youth camp in the United States with over 51,000 attending every summer. He is. Um, he did that until 2010 when he went into Congress in Oklahoma. In 2014, he became one of the U.S. Senators in, in Oklahoma, and he was elected to a full six-year term in 2016. Just a few years, well, I guess it's a couple years ago, he and I met here on campus. His daughter Hannah is a student here at Liberty, and I asked him about speaking in convocation, and he said, wait till Hannah gets closer to graduation. And the reason he asked, asked that is because I was, my, um, when I was young, my dad was a pastor full time, then he became politi politically active and all of a sudden I started getting all kinds of um, heat that I never got before in law school. I was at University of Virginia School of Law and so I did the same thing. I asked my dad to wait until I was about to graduate for him to come speak. And so um, I can understand what Hannah's going through, but she's, she's uh, finished in three years, done a brilliant job, and he brought four of his assistants with him today. I don't know if you can turn the lights on, but all four of them are Liberty graduates. Can you, can you turn the lights on over there? You got to stand up anyhow. These guys are young. They can see well, but I guess five. There you go. 
But, but James has just done an incredible job of fighting unnecessary and burdensome regulations, and he advocates for a more restrained federal government. Unless you've, unless you've been in business, you don't understand or you can't understand how crippling federal regulations can be to a business, how expensive they are, how they push up the cost of everything for everybody. It's something all of you will learn when you get out and start working and start um, or, or start a business. But we, um, we're so proud to have Senator Lankford and Representative Fox here today. Please join me in welcoming Senator James Lankford. All right, so Hannah is officially outed, I guess, now at this point. So glad, <clears throat> glad to be able to be in this conversation. And it'd be better if I get my iPad to work all of a sudden. That's a good start. Hey, let me, let me just get a chance to say, I want to have a conversation just about where you are spiritually and about what's going on in real life. There is a sense at times that to solve the nation's problems, we need to have a vote at some point. Or somebody in Washington, D.C. needs to be able to resolve that. The reality is it happens among us, and it happens in day-to-day -day life and in families. My journey into politics is kind of a weird journey, quite frankly. I don't have a lot of people that say, if you want to be a United States Senator one day, the best thing to do is be in youth ministry for 20 years. Not a lot of people say that. Though it was good preparation to work with juveniles for two decades before I went to Congress, that was helpful. <clears throat> This journey that I'm on is a journey not that different than yours. For me, walking into Congress was not something I had planned to do. I'd done youth ministry for 20 years, loved working with students, loved directing the Falls Creek Camp. But in the fall of 2008, God completely interrupted our life and spoke into us something we never thought we would hear Him say, run for Congress. Now those aren't, aren't rational words that you expect to say or do at some point. Most people don't get up one day and say, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to have a family, I'd like to have a couple kids, and then run for Congress one day. Because it's such an incredible life shift. But we knew this is what God called us to do. And we spent months struggling and praying through that, and finally reached the point that God had made it very, very clear to us, and I had the decision. I was either going to follow Him or not. And I have met a man before in his 70s who told me the story about hearing God call him one day, and he said no. And 50 years later, he still regretted that moment. I didn't want to be that man. So when I since God called me to run for Congress, the decision for me ultimately was to be able to follow him and trust him, or to be able to stay where I was. And I had folks that said to me, you're leaving ministry. <laughs> and I would say, no, I'm actually following Jesus the best way I know how. This is what he's called me to do, and so this is what I'm going to step in and do. Now, I say that quick story to you just to give you some background and context on it because I'm convinced the way that God leads and guides each of us, He has a specific purpose, and He is interested in guiding us into that purpose. I also say that to you because I am convinced that more and more people really do believe that government is the answer. Let me tell you, government is growing larger and more complicated for one reason, because families are collapsing. And as families are collapsing, government's getting bigger to try to help deal with the problems of families collapsing. So as families collapse, you have greater need for criminal justice. You have greater need for education issues. You have greater need for work training. You have greater need for drug issues. All of those things happen, and the government tries to step in and fill the gap because families are collapsing. We as conservatives often want to jump on the stack of government and say government's getting too big and try to push down the stack of government. What we really need to do is get under families and try to be able to lift them up. Because as families are lifted up, that gets turned around. It's in the family where you learn work ethic. It's in the family where you learn to be able to stay off drugs. It's in the family that you learn how to be able to deal with people. It's in your family that you learn race relations and how to be able to treat people with dignity and develop friends over multiple lines, whatever that may be. It's in families that you learn how to be able to respect people in poverty. Those are basic values. And that as our families lift up those values, it turns the nation around. And for many people in their own personal walk with God, as they walk with God through their own personal journey, they at some point get busy, get active, they grow a little bit in their faith, 
or they begin a relationship with God and they immediately look for, what are the rules? How am I going to do this? If I'm going to walk with God, tell me the parameters of how to be able to do this. They add some more rules, somebody else comes to them, adds some more rules, they get busy or they get burned out or they get bored with God because they've got so many things piled on them. I would submit to you that I think many Christians today make following Jesus harder than Jesus made following Jesus. Here's a simple truth. You want me to walk through this? Let me walk you through a couple of passages. We'll do a little quick Bible drill time with you. Matthew 4, 18. See if you can pick up a pattern here. Matthew 4, 18, it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net in the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. Mark 2, 13, once again, different, different time. Once again, Jesus went beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me. Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. John 1, 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Luke 9, 23, here it begins with this, and then he said to them all, in other words, in case I missed anyone, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Lest you think this was just about physically walking with Jesus. In John 21 is a really interesting story. In John 21, Jesus has been executed, he's been raised from the dead, he's meeting the disciples in Galilee, which is a really significant conversation. Before Jesus' execution even, he had said to the disciples, we will talk about these things in Galilee, in Galilee, in Galilee, and it came up over and over again. This is that conversation. This is the conversation where Peter and Jesus walk alongside the shore and the whole feed my sheep and feed my lambs, that whole conversation happened. But in the middle of it, Jesus at one point is talking to Peter, and he says this, John 21, 18 and 19, he says, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to a place you do not want to go. And then John makes this parenthetical statement, he says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This is right before Jesus' ascension. The same phrase, the same issue. Now, following Jesus even physically wasn't that simple to do. For the disciples, it wasn't a simple thing. Sometimes Jesus would stay in a place a long time, and the disciples were like, we need to go other places, and Jesus was like, no, we're going to linger here. Sometimes a huge crowd is coming to Jesus, and the disciples would say, everyone's waiting, and Jesus would say, that's nice, we're leaving and literally leave people just standing there. There was one time for the Feast of the Tabernacles where everybody was leaving, heading to the Feast of the Tabernacles, and Jesus said, for you, any time is right, but for me, I've got to stay. Everyone else leaves, and then a couple of days later, Jesus leaves and he goes there late, which to me is biblical justification that sometimes it's the right thing to do to be late to something, okay? So if you need biblical justification, Jesus was late to sing sometimes, and it was occasionally okay. One day they hear that Lazarus was sick, and all the disciples say, we need to go? And Jesus says, no, it's not the right time. We need to wait until he dies. Seems like a strange thing. And then they get up to go and actually head to Bethany. And Thomas says to Jesus, no, wait, last time we were there, they tried to kill you. And Jesus' response was, as long as it's day, you have to do work. In other words, this is where the light is going. I've got to be able to go there, no matter what the cost is on that. One day, Jesus says to the disciples, I want you to go into the next town, and when you get there, I want you to untie a colt and bring it to me. We know it is Palm Sunday. I recognize it as the day that the Jesus told his disciples to steal a horse. <laughs> Read the passage. Go into the next town. You're going to see a colt tied there. As soon as you come in, look on there. Just untie the colt and bring it to me. If anyone asks you, Jesus said, tell them the Lord needs it. You might try that next time you steal a car. Just test it out. <clears throat> when they pull you over, just say, the Lord needs it. It worked for the disciples. Maybe it'll work for you. Probably not, but it worked for them. It had to be a really nerve-wracking thing. It had to be just as nerve-wracking when Jesus said, we're going to set up for the uh, Passover time, and he tells the disciples, go into town, and there'll be a guy carrying a jar of water. Follow him. 
just think of how creepy that really is. Stand in the edge of town, find a guy carrying water, just start following him. Walk into the house and say, is the room ready? And the guy will say yes. That's what following Jesus looked like to the disciples. Even when he was physically there, it wasn't just a simple thing. Following him was a time confusing, but always involved a tremendous amount of faith. So here's my question to you. Jesus' statement over and over and over again was to the disciples, come follow me. He didn't give them an occupation. He didn't give them a location. He said, come follow me. Here's the life decision that you have. You ready? Every time you talk to some people, they say to you, what are you going to do after you leave college? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? How are you going to handle all this? The disciples had one simple answer. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but I do know who I'm going to follow. The revolution in the Christian life is when you stop, stop being obsessed with the what you do and you become obsessed with the who you follow. That's the revolution. <laughs> Sitting here in this room, you do not know what God's going to call you to do in the days ahead. You don't know the task. You may have a guess. You may be preparing yourself with a certain degree. You may be preparing yourself and setting out life goals. You don't know what's next. I've done 20 years of youth ministry, and then God radically shifted the direction. But that's what follow me looked like. And I had to make a decision, just like you do, who do you follow? The hard part is, I don't know if you've noticed, but he's invisible. How do you follow someone that you can't touch, that you can't see with your eyes, that you can't smell his fragrance as he goes by? How do you follow someone like that? Well, let me just give you some ideas. Since God created your mind and your ears and your eyes, He's not limited by creation. He can go around the system or He can use the system however He chooses to. Here are some ways that God leads us. This is going to be no-brainers kind of stuff. Number one is His Word. If you're not reading the Bible, you're not getting who He really is. And I'm amazed at the number of people that try to follow God but don't read Scripture. If you're not reading Scripture, you're not learning who God really is. You're making it up, or you're trying to put God in your image rather than you trying to work to be in His. <clears throat> the Bible that you have, <clears throat> the Bible that you have, every page of it, every verse that's in it, was written with two goals in mind. You ready? Who is God, and how do you follow Him? Every page has that on it. So at every page that you read of Scripture, you should be able to answer one of those two questions. God, what does this tell me about who you are, and what does this tell me about how to follow you? The Bible is loaded with terrible examples of people that were trying to follow God and got twisted off in all kinds of weird ways. Those stories are there to be able to teach us how to follow Him and how someone messed it up. Every page is teaching us about the character and nature of God. And the more that we come to know Him, the more that we become like Him. It's no different than you watch a great game in sports or athletics, and you want to go try that. It looks fun. That's why half of you in the past week or so has thought, where do I go that I can try to do curling? <clears throat> you know, you, a couple of weeks ago, you weren't thinking about that. Now you're obsessed with it, because I got to go try that. It's why you never, ladies, you never get in the car with a guy right after he just watched NASCAR. <clears throat> Give him a little time. Let that work out of his system a little bit, because immediately after watching NASCAR, you want to get in a vehicle and try that. You want to go down the street and think, if it, you ain't rubbing, you ain't racing, and go down the street. When you watch something and you take it in, you become interested in that. The more that you read Scripture and the more you learn about the character of God, He's transforming you. He's teaching you about Himself. If you're not taking in Scripture, you're not going to learn about Him. There are so many people that go into Scripture and they think Scripture is all a to-do list. Last Saturday, I put in a ceiling fan in my bedroom, which was about a two and a half hour experience. Violating all guy rules, I read the instructions. You're welcome for disappointing you. 
<clears throat> the guys are like, seriously, you read the instruction? Yes. I read the instructions. So pull the instructions out, going through everything so I don't electrocute myself or burn the house down. So as I'm going through, getting, getting through all the instructions, I follow the instructions. At the end of it, I flip on the switch. Look, there's light. Look, there's a fan working. How exciting. I didn't learn a thing about the engineer, though. I did learn how to put up a fan. The engineer that designed the fan, I have no idea who he is. People read the scripture and assume this is a to-do list and a what-to-not-do list. The scripture is not as much designed to tell us do and don't, it's designed as who is the designer of all things and how is he directing our path. It's a simple principle. As we take in his word, we learn how to be able to follow him. Second thing is obvious on this is spending time with other people that follow God. The more that you spend time with other people that follow God, they encourage you to follow God. That's why you can have one of the hardest weeks of your life, and if you're sitting in church right behind someone who's just outrageously worshiping, it encourages you. Because you realize their walk with God is also affecting you. The third thing's pretty simple as well, prayer. If you're not spending time alone with God in prayer, you're not going to be able to hear His instruction. You're not going to understand what follow me really means. John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Let me knock that in the head and drag it past you again. Listen. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. This is the part of Scripture that Joy Behar calls mental illness. This is the part where people say, God speaks to you? Yes. That's what follow me means. Now, it's one thing to be able to set issues in front of God. It's another thing for him to whisper into your soul, come follow me. I'm amazed at the number of people that struggle with this obvious thing, spending time with God, learning his voice, he will direct your steps. Now, you either believe this or you don't. But for those that are followers of Christ, we believe that he is not only alive, but that he cares about our daily life. And if he cares about his daily life, why would it be so radical that he also doesn't direct us in our daily life? Why is that a radical concept? He is a God who loves us, and he wants the best for our life. Our decision is whether we're going to follow him or not or spend time enough to be able to hear him. How do you learn his voice? I would ask you a couple things. If you graduate from college in your own walk with God and you've not learned how to be able to discern God's voice, you need to get time alone with God and start asking, God, teach me your voice. Teach me how to hear your instruction. Teach me how to listen to your Holy Spirit. You're going to need that discipline for the rest of your life if you decide to follow him. You're either going to leave this place in your own walk with God and say, I'm going to live a moral life and be satisfied with that, or you're going to walk out of here and say, I'm going to learn how to follow God, which by the way, he's never going to lead you to an immoral life, but he's also going to lead you to radical places in people, in events, in things that you would have never imagined before. There is nothing quite so intimidating as beginning your day with a simple prayer, God, today I want to follow you. Would you lead me? You want to talk about putting your whole life out there. You have no idea what he's going to smile and say. Great, because today I want to lead you here. How do you learn his voice? Time. There is no substitute. If my phone were to ring right now, and I were to just answer it, and someone on the other end of the line says, hi, honey, how are things going? I should not say, who is this? <laughs> that would be a bad idea, because there's only one person that's going to say that to me. It's going to be my wife, and I should recognize that voice. That should not be a voice I should say, gosh, this is so familiar. What's your name again? But I'm amazed at the number of people that don't spend enough time with God that when God speaks to them, they recognize it as God's voice. Just time. Some people haven't heard God's voice, quite frankly, because you don't want God to lead you. 
because he's dangerous. And you don't know what he will do. Some people don't want to hear God's voice because they know they're in a relationship that's not God-honoring, and they're afraid if they pray, God's going to bring it up. So it's easier just not to pray so I can do what I want. Why should I listen to God? He's just going to tell me to stop what I already know is wrong. I don't know what it might be for you. Some people have never asked for his leadership because they've never, quite frankly, thought about it. The simple statement of Jesus, ask, seek, knock, seems to be for somebody else, but you've never considered it might be for you. Some people, quite frankly, don't hear God's voice because God told them to do something sometimes years ago, and they told God, no, I'm not going to change this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. No. And God brought it up, brought it up, brought it up, and now it's just radio silence from God. Maybe hearing God's voice again means going backwards and finding the last thing He told you and doing that. And the radical transformation occurs with being able to hear His voice again. The real question is, not can you hear His voice, because I believe you can. The real question is, do you trust Him? Do you trust Him enough to put your whole life out there and say, God, today I want to follow you? Or do you trust Him enough to be moral, but not to really follow Him? God will speak to you if you trust Him. And if you answer in advance, before He says anything to you, whatever you say, I'll follow you. I don't know what that'll be for you, and the good news is you don't know either. But you can trust Him. Just about every one of you has a GPS app on your phone, and when you get turned around someplace, you have a certain app that you go to. You probably also have a certain app you don't go to because you've used a certain GPS app on your phone and it took you some weird, bizarre direction. And you got there and you thought, where am I? And how come this is recalculating? Or how come this is turning me around? It's, I, I can't trust it. I have a certain app on my phone. I never use it for directions because I know it's going to turn me down. And you know which one I'm talking about? Because you've tried it as well. You've learned what you can trust and what you can't trust. My question is, have you learned if you can trust God to follow Him? Are you willing to be able to listen to His instruction and to be able to take it from there? Are you willing to be able to stretch out and to be able to trust Him with your every day, not just your sometimes a day? In all likelihood, some folks here, you trust God with your Sundays or you trust God with going to Bible studies, but through the rest of your time, you don't. Can I just say, if you only trust God on weekends, that's not a faith. That's called a hobby. A hobby is something you do on weekends. A faith is something you do throughout the course of your all, whole life. <clears throat> I'm fascinated when some people say to me, how can you walk in your faith in Congress? How does that work? I'm like, well, let's see. I walk in the building, and I talk to people, and you live your faith. I mean, it's no different than living your faith at college. When you came here, you made a decision on who you're going to hang with and what you were going to do, and it's taking your life a different direction. I have the same decision I make in Congress. It's no different. If your faith penetrates everything that you do, it affects how you treat other people, how you speak to other people, even people you disagree with. If that person's creating the image of God, you treat them differently. It's a part of your faith. It penetrates every part of every day. The decision isn't what I'm going to do. The decision is who I'm going to follow. That's the same decision that you make. There's nothing about Jesus that's not countercultural, and that's not recent. It's always been that way. So the decision is, what are you going to do with it? Thomas was completely confused by this. At one point, Jesus was talking to all of the disciples and talking about heading on the way, and Thomas just looks at him and says, in John 14, just says, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? 
I love his honesty. It's like, we've been following you for three years and we can't figure this out. And Jesus just looks at him and says, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're trying to figure out places. Just do this. Follow me. And I'll guide you. The most radical decision you can make any morning is to get up and to say, today, God, I want to follow you. My question is, are you willing to trust God that much today? Or are you content just living moral and thinking that's enough? That's not what he called us to. And that's not what it means to be his disciple. It's not about the task you're going to do. It's about who you're going to follow. You willing to take that risk? Why don't you bow your heads for a moment? I want to pray for you. Father, you have called these students to be here. You have put incredible leaders at this university around them. You're sinking truth into them. And I pray that they would drink it in like water. Father, would you help the individuals in this room to trust you enough to follow you? Help them to know your word. Help them to be alone with you in prayer. Help them to discipline themselves to your wisdom and your direction. For the sake of our nation, for the sake of the families that are to be, for the sake of their own family, guide us, Father. We trust you. We believe. Help us in our unbelief. Now, with your head down for just a second, can I ask you to do something simple? If you're bold enough to pray it, would you just quietly pray, God, teach me your voice. Today, I want to follow you. Why don't you look at me for just a second? I really believe any person that desires to be led by God, God desires to lead him. That when Jesus said, come follow me, he actually meant it. But if you're a person that just puts your head down and politely is quiet while everyone else is praying, and you really don't know what it means to be able to walk with God, you know there are friends around you that would love to talk to you about what it means to move from being polite when others pray and you coming to know the creator of the universe. If you've never come to know him, don't squander this day. There is so much more to what God created you to be if you're willing to take a huge risk and follow the one who designed you and made you. So catch one of the folks that you know in class, catch one of the folks you know as a follower of Jesus and just say, hey, I don't know how to pray and see if they'll walk you through it in the days ahead. God bless y'all. Let's thank both of these leaders. Bless you, brother. Thank you so much for that timely word. God bless you. Hey, remember, Ms. Fox's book is available in bookstores everywhere and in our own Barnes & Noble as well. God bless you. Thank you. You're dismissed.